please. And if you could preferably sit in these two middle blocks of seats. Uh, the room is obviously set up for a much wider projection. But for now, if we could concentrate into the two middle banks of seats, we can have a sort of more close-knit, friendly session. Thank you. So uh, this first session, I should introduce myself. My name is John Cooper. I'm at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. And I'm Julie Eisengart. I am at the University of Minnesota. And we're uh, moderating this first session. And we're starting the whole meeting off. It uh, falls on us to get the session off to the meeting off to a good start. Uh, and we have a great range of speakers selected from abstracts that were submitted. But before they talk, uh, we have uh, a plenary lecture from Professor Francis Platt from the University of Oxford, who's going to tell us about her groundbreaking work as proof of principle as what you can learn from a so-called simple monogenetic disease. Uh, in this instance, this will be, Fran will be talking about her work in Neiman pick disease type C. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Fran uh, up to tell us about her work. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing all about your latest uh, developments in this area. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organizers for um, inviting me. Uh, I don't know if any of you know that we've had a massive heat wave in Northern Europe at the moment. So we've got record temperatures similar actually to the weather here. So it's actually nice to be in a country that knows how to do air conditioning, uh, which uh, certainly the UK has uh, some way to go on. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, these very complex pathogenic cascades in lysosomal diseases, and I'm just going to illustrate it by focusing on a single disorder um, today, which is neiman pick type C. Now, when we think about um, pathogenic pathways, and we've got our single gene defect, uh, in, in this case in lysosomal disease pathogenesis, it triggers this so-called pathogenic cascade that you can think of as this sort of um, waterfall analogy with the storage material down here. And I think these kind of linear perceptions of pathogenic cascades are useful at one level, but they probably bear no resemblance to reality. And in fact, what we're seeing is that we're dealing with uh, pathogenic pathways in which there's a lot of collateral changes that occur in the cell. And the reason that it matters to try and figure out what exactly at the cellular level goes wrong in these diseases is that many of these um, tangential pathways that may all be contributing at some level to pathogenesis may actually be tractable with existing drugs. So from a drug repurposing and a, a way of identifying new targets for treatment, we think that there's, uh, it's important to try and get to grips with uh, at least some of the changes that are occurring at the cellular level. Now in order to do this, uh, there's no one size fits all methodology. And uh, the work that we've been doing, we don't do very much on the genetics, but we do a lot on the cell biology, particularly lipid biochemistry, metabolism, a lot of the omics uh, technologies, particularly lipid omics. But we've also taken advantage of model organisms, particularly yeast and, and mouse, as well as using human, human cells. And this is why these kind of studies take a long time to elucidate, because they're actually quite complex to undertake. Now, neiman pick c for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, is a somewhat unusual lysosomal disease. In terms of its clinical presentation, it's, it's um, fairly um, you know, within the norms of uh, what we all uh, know about lysosomal diseases. It has cerebellar atrophy, ataxia, and dementia, so it's a CNS disorder. Again, the frequency is, is you know, one in 100,000 live births, which is similar to other uh, lysosomal disorders. But where this disease becomes more interesting is that it has a very unusual um, uh, genetic basis in that two independent genes, when mutated, cause the same disease. Uh, mutations in either the NPC1 or NPC2 gene uh, cause uh, the same clinical picture. So the idea is that these gene, the products of these genes are cooperating in some common pathway, the NPC cellular pathway. Biochemically, they're interesting because there's storage of cholesterol and multiple sphingolipids. 
And there's also de delivery, a failure in delivery of LDL-derived uh, cholesterol from the lysosome to the ER. Um, and the other thing that, from a cell biological point of view, that is interesting about this disease is that there's almost a complete block in late endosome lysosome fusion. So this is a, a trafficking disorder. And there's only one currently approved therapy for this, uh, which is Miglostat, which is a substrate reduction therapy drug for reducing uh, glycosphingolipid biosynthesis. Now, if you look at the two gene products um, that are responsible for this disease, they couldn't look more dissimilar. One of them is a, um, a uh, membrane protein, um, NPC1, that's responsible for most cases of neiman pick and it's this multi-membrane pass um, putative transporter that sits in the limiting membrane of the lysosome. NPC2 is a small mannose-6-phosphorylated soluble cholesterol binding protein. Uh, that's in the lumen of the lysosome. So the, the real conundrum in this field is how do these two proteins interact and what, what is it that they're catalyzing in terms of um, the uh, NPC pathway. Now I also should mention that this pathway is also interesting from an infectious disease point of view because it turns out that the NPC1 protein, which is shown in this upper panel, is the receptor for the Ebola virus. And inhibitors of the NPC protein uh, are good Ebola therapies, at least in in, in vitro and animal models. Um, and it's really sort of put the NPC field on the map with the infectious disease community to try and understand how and why Ebola has evolved to use NPC1 and, in fact, just one loop of the NPC structure um, as its receptor. Another really interesting thing is that uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis sheds lipids that inhibit NPC1 as a way of blocking phagosome lysosome fusion. So this seems to be a hot spot for infectious disease pathogens um, to converge on, and we're trying to also understand the range of intracellular pathogens that may exploit uh, this pathway. Now, from a rather linear point of view, having said linear pathways are just the tip of the iceberg, a, a number of years ago, we inactivated the NPC1 uh, protein, sorry, um, we inactivated the NPC1 protein and looked at the biochemistry of what, what occurs following NPC1 inactivation. And very surprisingly, sphingosine, which is a breakdown product of ceramide, is the first biochemical change you can detect. So sphingosine storage occurs. And then the lysosome is also a regulated calcium store. And what happens is that the ability of this store to fill or retain calcium is reduced. And it's this calcium defect that results in this block in late endosome lysosome fusion, and you then get secondary buildup of these other lipids. So what we've been interested in doing is trying to understand whether we can dissect more detail around this pathway and understand cellular pathways that are affected in this disease. So one of the things that we've been doing is using biochemical tools, chemical biology tools, to look at some of these aspects. And this is work by Doris Hoglinger. Uh, Doris has just set up her own lab in Heidelberg now. And she comes from a, a chemical biology background and made this beautiful cage sphingosine so that we could test the hypothesis that NPC1 might be a sphingosine transporter. And that's the reason that sphingosine builds up in this disease. And what you're looking at here is a trifunctional sphingosine uh, probe. It has a large cage group, which you release with light. And then you've got a fairly native sphingosine backbone that you can then uh, illuminate by fixation and uh, the addition of a fluorescent tag. If you look in control cells within, really as soon as you can measure them, you can see that the uncaged sphingosine is beginning to look punctate. And then by 10 minutes, it's moved through to the ER. Um, I don't know whether that was something I pressed or uh, somebody else. But essentially what happens is that that sphingosine probe um, is naturally moving, it's trapped in the lysosome and then moves rapidly out through transport pathways. But if you pharmacologically block NPC1 or you silence it, you can see that you retain this lysosomal punctate pattern, which supports the concept that this protein is indeed involved in some way in sphingosine transport. You can also see a very nice correlation with clinical um, patient-derived fibroblasts, where the very severe ones have the most extreme phenotype. Uh, you can see this moderate and severe patients where they have the most punctate staining. So we've been taking advantage of these novel chemical probes to try and um, understand more about this pathway.
Now, the, at the moment, there are a number of therapeutic um, uh, experimental therapies that are in clinical trials for neem and C, and we've attempted to map these onto this uh, rather linear scheme of pathogenesis. Um, gene therapy is actually showing promise, even though this is a membrane protein. There are heat shock protein um, activators of um, activators of heat shock protein production that cause uh, an improvement of unstable mutant transcripts. Miglostat, we think, is affecting sphingosine levels. Um, but there are also a number of other um, uh, compounds in clinical trials, including cyclodextrin. And we've also trialed things like calcium modulators, like curcumin, that I'll come back to a little bit later on. So I think, suffice it to say, we have a very poor understanding at the moment of how, how these experimental therapies work in neem and C. And one of the drivers of looking at pathogenesis in more detail has been to try and understand that better. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is some new data that have come out of using yeast as a model system. And this is work by um, Ali Kaleso, who's now a postdoc in Copenhagen. Um, and actually, Ali is from um, uh, California originally. And this was work that was funded through a sphingolipid consortium in Europe. Uh, and as a uh, about to be Brexiting British person, who I have to stress didn't vote for Brexit, um, I'm rather embarrassed to be standing here um, with an EU-funded project, but um, this was a very uh, nice study that uh, was funded by the, by the EU. So what Ali did was she uh, went on secondment to the Weizmann Institute in Israel and worked with Maya Schuldinger's lab, who are yeast geneticists. And what uh, Ali basically did was uh, run a number of yeast screens where we were looking at the interacting binding proteins uh, using the ortholog of NPC1 in yeast uh, the protein is called NCR1 in the yeast system. So this, this protein is conserved from yeast to man, and Ali's been characterizing proteins that are part of a complex with NCR1. She also looked at a synthetic lethal screen. Um, NCR1 deficient yeast, are not, it's not lethal. Um, she's looked at which other genes would need to be uh, deficient to cause lethality, to try and understand which pathways this works in. And she's also looked at which of the uh, proteins encoded by the yeast genome are mislocalized. And as you can imagine, this generated a large amount of data, and I'm just going to focus on a couple of aspects today. And what was really interesting for us is that it highlighted a number of pathways that we already knew, like calcium dysregulation, trafficking defects. There was also some literature on metal ion dysregulation in NPC. But what she found was that nutrient sensing pathways were implicated, and very interestingly, the cytoskeleton, the actin cytoskeleton and microtubule network, there were genes involved in the regulation of that system that came out. And this is not something that the NPC field has really looked at in the past. And so I'm just going to talk to you about our exploration of this aspect. So the question that we asked was, if there's a signature of genes in yeast that are dysregulated in response to NCR1 deficiency that are involved in the biology of the cytoskeleton, could we find uh, a correlates of this in mammalian cells? Because there are differences in the way that uh, the cytoskeleton is used by yeast versus mammalian cells. And this is work by uh, Gokan uh, Yilmaz and Stephanie Newman, two PhD students in the lab. And the first thing that we found was that if you looked at the microtubule network and you looked at the degree of acetylation of microtubules, this is a wild-type uh, fibroblast from an NPC. Um, this is a control fibroblast. Um, and these are NPC patient fibroblasts shown here. And you can see that the red is acetylated microtubules. And this is a very dramatic phenotype that you can see in two different uh, patient samples. Very interestingly, the miglostat treated uh, uh, samples from patients were pretty much completely corrected, and there was partial correction by cyclodextrin. So again, using the therapeutics to try and understand you know, what is correctable to try and get a handle on the mechanism that's driving this. But one of the interesting findings in the yeast screen was that there were two um, proteins that were uh, highlighted uh, shown here, this uh, SHE4 and PRK1, and both of these were involved in not the microtubule network, but in the actin cytoskeleton. So we decided to have a look at this in more detail in the mammalian system. And we looked at a very actin-dependent process. Um, we looked in macrophages at the process of phagocytosis, 
because you have to assemble actin filaments into these phagocytic cups in order to facilitate internalization of the particle. And obviously, this is a critical process for innate immune function. And I won't wade through all the data. I'll just highlight the, uh, the bottom line, which is we found impaired phagocytosis of multiple different particle types. There are different pathways of internalization of particles by macrophages, and it didn't matter which one we looked at. They were all deficient. Um, and the other thing was that the kinetics of the process were slow. So they weren't completely incompetent at phagocytosis, but it was extremely slow, and it never reached the maximal capacity. Other phagocytic pathways can be impaired in response to different particle sizes. And again, size made no difference in this assay. It was, a, it was an across-the-board defect. So this was consistent with there being an actin uh, phenotype. Now, I don't know how well you can see this from the back, but if, if you look at a wild-type Neiman Pixie macrophage on the left, we've, we've fed particles to this, uh, these cells. These are, these are microbeads. And where you see these black zones, that's where the bead is. And in red, you can see the actin assembling around it. So you can see these sort of circles uh, that you can see very easily. Here's our Neiman Pixie macrophage. These are from the mouse, the null mouse model. And you can see this very different distribution of actin and only the odd phagocytic cup that you can identify. Now, again, we looked at whether or not this phagocytosis could be reversed with the existing therapies that we know about that can correct NPC cells. And very interestingly, Miglostat again was a corrector. So was curcumin, which is compensating for this lack of calcium release from the lysosome by raising cytosolic calcium levels. But when we looked at cyclovextrin treatment, this did not reverse it. So again, we're hoping that this differential response to these three agents will give us clues as to what's driving these um, changes in actin cytoskeleton. And again, I won't wade through all the, the uh, bar graphs um, in my jet-lagged state, uh, but I'll just tell you the bottom line. Now, one of the things that we sometimes forget when we think about lysosomal storage diseases is that we focus on storage, the excess material, but we forget that 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 trapping and accumulation of material within the endocytic system means that you have deficiency in other compartments. And this is just showing you that if you look at wild-type cells, sorry, uh, wild-type cells at the top, this is staining with um, cholera toxin to look at GM1 ganglioside in the plasma membrane. Here are our wild-type cells, and these are NPC fibroblasts. And you can see that the, the, these are non-permeabilized cells. All of the GM1 that's stored in this disease is actually intracellular. So you've got a reduction in glycosphingolipids at the plasma membrane. We tried an experiment where we fed back the glycosphingolipids that are normally present in the plasma membrane to see if it would correct this phagocytic defect, because there is a literature suggesting that sphingolipids at the plasma membrane are at the junction of the interface with the actin cytoskeleton at the plasma membrane. And very interestingly, when we um, gave back exogenous GM1 ganglioside, but not other ganglioides or neutral glycolipids, we were able to rescue phagocytic activity. So it looks as though part of this problem with assembling the actin cytoskeleton at the plasma membrane may be indirectly due to this trafficking abnormality of um, sphingolipids that occurs in this disease. The other thing we noticed in these studies is that we were feeding the cells um, in, in some of our experiments with, um, with basically opsonized particles. These are antibody-coated particles that would be taken up through FC receptor pathways in the macrophage. And we did flow cytometry to show that we hadn't lost FC receptor levels at the plasma membrane as a control, and indeed the levels were the same. But when we used high-resolution microscopy to look at this, you can see that on the uh, left-hand panel in the NPC wild-type cell, the FC receptor at the plasma membrane is in a normal distribution uh, spread evenly across the cell and is very dynamic, whereas in the NPC uh, null cells, you can see that we've got this very, very patchy distribution. And we've also got some microscopy uh, videos that show that the motility of these receptors is abnormal. So we've also, in addition to the cytoskeletal problems, got distribution changes in receptors at the plasma membrane, and we're trying to understand how general this is and whether it's unique to FC receptors. Our suspicion is it may actually be quite broad, broad spectrum. Now, in terms of the mechanism, um, 
If you look at this uh, schematic from a very nice nature review on um, the uh, components of the regulating um, actin cytoskeleton, uh, we knew that we had this profound phagocytic defect. So we looked at some of the players that are known to be involved in forming phagocytic structures. And in particular, there's something called the wave 2 ARP23 complex that is important for um, actin nucleation. And we looked by um, a, a variety of uh, microscopy and Western blotting. And you can see here that in the NPC deficient cells, you've got almost no wave 2 expression that you can detect in this Western blot. If you stimulate the cells to induce higher levels of wave 2 expression that you can do with um, platelet-derived growth factor, you get a very nice robust response in the wild-type cells, and you do get some upregulation in our uh, NPC deficient cells, but you can see that there's a really profound loss of uh, protein expression. You can also see if you just stain the actin cytoskeleton in an unstimulated system that you have this complex structure in the wild type and these very linear, non-complex structures in the NPC cell. When you stimulate with PDGF to stimulate, phagocyte, uh, to, uh, stimulate migration, what happens in a healthy cell is that along the leading edge, you can see wave 2 decorates the leading edge. But when you look at the leading edge in the NPC cells, there's a lack of wave 2 decorating this, and it's all trapped within the cell. You can also see that the actin cytoskeleton in red is not anywhere near as highly organized as it is in the wild-type counterpart. So what we think um, this might imply is that there may also be a migration defect going on, uh, st stimulated by these changes in cytoskeleton. And the machinery for migration and phagocytosis involves the same players in these uh, actin pathways. And again, I won't wade through all the data, but basically what we found is that the um, if you do a scratch assay looking at wound healing using fibroblasts from the NPC1 null mouse um, or the heterozygous mice or the wild type mice, and you can just show shown down here at the 24 hour time point, you can see that there's this impairment in um, basically in the, um, there's a, a rapid uh, wound healing that occurs in the wild type cells. They close the gap very rapidly. The heterozygotes interestingly are intermediate and the nulls have this profound slow response to, um, uh, to wound healing, which is a result of this migratory defect secondary to these cytoskeletal changes. So what we think is happening is that this drop in wave two uh, expression is affecting the, um, the ability of the uh, actin cytoskeleton to be uh, remodeled. Um, and so you're having an effect on uh, migration and a failure in lamellopodia formation. You're not forming phagocytic cups uh, for phagocytosis properly. And also it may be contributing to the lack of mobility of plasma membrane receptors like FC receptor. The fact that things like ARP3, RAC, and the WASP complex are all expressed at normal levels, we think protects the system from a total collapse in this system. So what we're seeing is impairment, not a complete loss of function. Now, why might this be all relevant to uh, presentation of clinical signs in patients? Well, I think there are two main reasons. Firstly, it's been shown, and this is a work that was uh, stimulated by um, Ed Wraith um, in Manchester and has been continued by Holm Ehrlich and other collaborators um, in Oxford. And this is really showing that if you look at the penetrance of Crohn's disease in Neemopic C, it's actually the highest for any monogenic disorder. It's in the region of about 3 to 7% penetrance. And it, the significance is that it's, it's occurring in children and infants of a very young age compared to the general population where the mean onset of age of, uh, of Crohn's is about 30, 30 years of age. And in this study looking at the Crohn's pathogenesis um, in this publication in GUT in 2016, it was shown that there was a microbial handling defect, which we think in conjunction with um, the work that we've been doing on the connection between Neiman Pixi and TB means that probably the microbiome of these patients will be altered and they have an inability to handle microbes in a, an appropriate way. And I think that this is an area that is very tractable from a therapeutic point of view and we need to understand better what the microbiome looks like and what these um, inflammatory pathways look like uh, in response to uh, microbial challenge. 
The other thing that we've also started to look at is that obviously the cytoskeleton matters a great deal for neurons, and particularly it's the long projection neurons that suffer in, in neomimpic C disease and many of the lysosomal diseases. And we, we're looking to see whether or not cytoskeletal abnormalities may affect synaptic function, spine formation, dendritogenesis, uh, because this is an area that hasn't been looked at to date. And so that's work in progress. And uh, uh, hopefully in a, a couple of years, we may have a more complete picture on that. So just to sum up then, um, what I think we're dealing with is highly complex pathogenic pathways in, in uh, these monogenic diseases. So the genetic cause is simple, and then we're dealing with a number of pathways that are abnormal. Now, of course, in neiman pick c we're not dealing with an enzyme deficiency. We're dealing with some sort of transport protein that acts in a complex with other partners that we're beginning to characterize through the yeast screen. Uh, but what we can say is that if you look at the pathways affected in NPC, there's now robust data of mitochondrial dysfunction. There's fundamental shifts in metabolism away from aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration in the brain. We've got metal ion handling problems. We've got nutrient sensing defects. The cytoskeleton is a new area of research um, following on from what I've been talking about. We have changes in sphingolipid metabolism and trafficking. And we've also got calcium signaling, this defect in calcium signaling from the lysosome that will have, have effects on crosstalk with other signaling organelles like the ER and mitochondria. So at the moment, what we're trying to understand fully is the mechanism of the cytoskeletal defects. Where do they fit in this pathogenic cascade? Why are they differentially responsible to different therapeutic agents? And what does that tell us about not only the mechanism, but also I think as we move towards combination therapy for neiman pick c patients, we need to be choosing a combination of treatments that maximize the spread of correction of these different pathways. There's no point in having three things that all correct the cytoskeleton if we're leaving everything else um, affected. So I think we can use the therapeutics as tools and then hopefully go full circle to design better therapeutic combinations for patients. And really intriguingly, um, why does GM1 ganglioside play a role at this plasma membrane in coordinating with the actin cytoskeleton? Is that direct, indirect, and where does the biochemical selectivity come from that we've identified? Um, so I will, um, on that note, uh, just uh, thank again the collaborators um, within my own lab um, on the left-hand side, everybody in dark here has uh, contributed actively to these studies, and this is at the wider lab. Uh, Maya for the um, yeast work, and Carsten and uh, Doris for the, uh, the sphingosine probe, and Anthony Gallioni for the work on um, the uh, calcium dysregulation in this disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fran, for that uh, very elegant description of uh, how to do it, uh, how to take apart and look at that very complex pathogenic cascade. And I think that's an inspiration for all of us who try to do the same thing in other diseases. So thank you, Fran. We have time for a quick question or two from the audience. Yeah, so at the moment, Holm Ehrlig, who is the gastroenterologist who's been working, he, he has an interest in monogenic diseases with Crohn's penetrance. He's trying to assemble a cohort in which to address that question. And also, I think it's something that there's been discussion about adding to the questionnaires on the uh, NPC patient-held registry, another EU-funded uh, registry. Um, because I think we need to start capturing this information because heterozygosity does not look normal at the cellular level or at the mouse model level. And the question is, what are the risk factors for the heterozygous carriers? There's been a very elegant genetic study showing that they, along with many of the lysosomal diseases, are actually heterozygosity for NPC and many of the other diseases is a risk factor for Parkinson's. So this now extends way beyond Gaucher. But I think these questions about Crohn's and about other neurological or inflammatory diseases is data that we need to capture. Um, unfortunately, we haven't got an animal model that develops Crohn's in their lifespan because these animals have got a very short uh, lifespan. It's, it would be very nice to have an animal model that recapitulated that to study it in more detail. <laughs>
I was okay. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, normally, in my peak C is always considered a cholesterol storage disorder or transport disorder, but temporarily. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. Sorry. You need to uh, the microphone. Yeah, because it, okay. So the mammon peak C is always considered a problem of cholesterol yeah. transport and storage. So yeah. how temporarily you fit all these yeah. events? Because uh, this makes um, as if the, these events are parallel to the storage or the transport or are independent. What do you think about it? Yeah, no, no, I, I, I don't, don't mean to imply that. What, what we were surprised at when we did the inactivation of NPC1 was that it takes hours and hours and hours after inactivation of the gene to see changes in the sphingolipid levels and in the cholesterol levels. So we don't think that NPC1 is a cholesterol transporter in a traditional sense, it's probably a cholesterol regulated transporter. We've also, you know, cholesterol accumulation in the lysosome has consequences for things like bile acid production in the ER, and that uh, uh, has collateral damage on the P450 system. Um, so I'm, uh, these are all, what I'm saying is that all of those little tributaries from that, that um, waterfall are all pathogenically contributing, but in order to understand how to maximally engineer therapies, we need to know what's the peak of that cascade and who are the players down, down the way. And I think that one of the things that I not, didn't talk about for the sake of keeping this relatively simple is that we've got a manuscript under review at the moment where, to me, the simplest explanation for the cholesterol phenomenon in Nemopixy is you're not going to move cholesterol one molecule at a time through some cytosolic transporter that we had never identified. It's much more likely that these lipids are moving at contact sites. And what we're finding is there's a failure in lysosome to ER contact sites, and actually NPC1 may be part of that tethering machinery, uh, which would then make sense, because when NPC is deficient, you're just not forming junctions where those lipids can flow. And that probably applies to sphingolipids as well. So I think that's another whole level of complexity in this, but I think cholesterol matters. But I don't think uh, the simplistic description of this as a primary cholesterol storage disease is accurate. Okay, I, we can have one very quick question, but then in the interest of time, we'll move on to uh, our talk selected from abstracts. One quick question, thank you, Fran, great talk. Matthew Allen with Iowa State. Uh, does Neiman Pick C2 uh, also have a carrier phenotype, or is that, are those <coughs> carriers normal? Yeah, I don't think that there's been as much work done on that, um, and I'm not sure if the NPC2 mouse carriers have been aged to a point or had behaviorals done in the same way as the NPC ones. But the prediction is, um, well, I don't know what the prediction is. Um, it's complicated because when you look at the cell biological level, there are some differences between NPC2 and NPC1. And I think until we've got more data on that, it's going to be difficult to predict whether they are um, going to be affected, but they're also, NPC2 is also on the list of genetic, um, basically mutations in the NPC2 gene in the heterozygous state are also overrepresented in Parkinson's. So I think there's every chance that they, it will be, but I'm not basing that on any data apart from the Parkinson's study. Okay, I think we should all thank Fran again for a wonderful talk. Uh, if we have, we all have other questions, I'm sure Fran will be happy to answer them afterwards. So thank you again, Fran, and we'll move on to the first talk. I'd just like to ask the AV people, if possible, could we have the display here so that it has the slides as just one big display rather than the eight different screens that we currently have? Sorry, 12 different screens. It will, it will make life much easier for the speaker. So I will now hand over to Julie okay. to introduce the first speaker. Yes. So our first speaker is Camila de Brito Parade Aragao um, from Canada, and she will be uh, discussing synaptic dysfunction in San Filippo type C syndrome. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about synaptic dysfunction in San Filippo type C syndrome. So uh, San Filippo type C syndrome, also known as MPS3C, 
is a very rare recessive uh, disorder that is mostly neurological. So it's caused by mutations on the ages not gene that encodes for a lysosomal transmembrane enzyme that is responsible for the uh, acetylation of heparin sulfate. And in the absence or in the reduction of this enzyme activity, we have accumulation of heparin sulfate in the lysosomes, and it causes mostly neurological sy symptoms. So our MPS3C mouse model, uh, uh, it, it, it has uh, reduc reduced anxiety, it's, uh, it's uh, hyperactive, and it has, uh, sorry, I'm gonna come back. So, so it has uh, significant neuronal loss by the age of 10 months, and uh, based on these behavior abnormalities that uh, they develop, we decided to study the synaptic dysfunction in this mouse model. So our hypothesis is that the cognitive dysfunction that happens in this mouse model uh, prior where, uh, when the uh, death of neurons is significant could be associated with a defect in neurotransmission. So just some basic concepts. Here we have a neuron, and in the neuron we have uh, the axon, and we have dendrites. And in these dendrites, we have what we call synaptic spines. So synaptic spines are protrusion from the membrane that are very important, that are very, they're very dynamic, and they're important for cognition, for memory, and for long-term potentiation. And these spines can be classified in four different shapes, stubby, philopodia, uh, thin, and mushroom. And uh, the philopodia shape is the immature form of the spine, and once this spine starts to be, uh, rece start to receive the excitatory inputs in the central nervous system, they start to develop uh, this bigger shape of uh, mushroom shape, and, and it starts to be more and more resp uh, responsive to the synapse. So here uh, is how we see by electron microscopy, so we have the spine, and we have the synaptic vesicles in, 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 the, in the synapse and the axonal terminal. And some other points that we also wanted to study was some synaptic proteins, for example, synapsin 1 and synaptophysin, which are a member of the Wiesner complex. And we also studied the excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmission. So we chose some uh, pairs of markers, presynaptic and postsynaptic markers. For the excitatory, for example, we used the uh, vesicular glutamate transporter, VGLUT1, and PSD9 to 5 for a postsynaptic marker that is associated with the uh, uh, glutamate neurotransmission. And for the inhibitory, we studied the VGAT, which is the vesicular transporter for GABA, and the uh, gaffrin, which is an assembly protein in the postsynaptic site. So one of the th first things that we assessed in this mouse and in, in this neurons from this mouse model uh, was the synaptic spines. So here we have uh, data from uh, culture neurons in vitro. So it's the first uh, upper panels over here. So in the culture neurons, what we observed is that even they have similar uh, density of synaptic spines. What happens with the MPS3C neurons is that the, their, their spines are mostly immature. So we have uh, a shift. And in, in, we have more immature philopodia spines instead of having mushroom spines. And when we uh, analyze that in vivo, uh, we have a reduction of uh, total density of these spines. So these are all uh, hippocampal neurons. And here is from, uh, in, from the in vivo is the uh, uh, neurons from the CA1 region of the hippocampus. So we have here, this, again, the spines and the number of spines, and we, are, we assessed in different ages. So even as early as 10 days, uh, postnatal 10 days, uh, the, the number of spines in these hippocampal neurons are reduced. And we wanted to also observe if that, that, uh, that trend could be, uh, that, that sign could be found in other lysosomal storage diseases. So we also, uh, had, we also have two different other mouse models in our lab. So we have mouse for sialidosis and for Tay-Sachs disease, and we also study the synaptic spines there. And uh, they're all uh, as, as the same as we found in the MPS3C uh, neurons, they are always also, also reduced. And, also, and they are not only reduced, but they are also in uh, smaller size. 
So uh, based on that, we started to go further and uh, assess uh, how, how these uh, characteristics could be affecting the neurotransmission. So these are images from uh, cultural hippocampal neurons. So we analyzed the, the synapses in these neurons, and uh, we observed that in the MPS3C neurons, they have uh, mostly uh, axodendritic uh, uh, synapses. So usually for the excitatory input, we have the spine and we have the, uh, the excitatory input coming into the spine. But once uh, these spines are reduced or once they're immature, these neurons start making synapses in a different way. So what we observed that they have, there's a shift between uh, axo, uh, spinous to axodendritic uh, synapse. So uh, looking more at the synaptic vesicles, so these two markers, as I mentioned earlier, synapsin-1 and synaptophysin, which are in the, in the synaptic vesicles. Uh, so we, do the moon, we did immunofluorescence, and there's a re reduction of synapsin and, synapsin, uh, and synaptophysin. And when we, looked at, uh, when we look at the level of uh, electron, the, the ultra uh, structure, so we quantified these this vesicles and we observed in both in culture neurons from these uh, mice and also uh, in the brains from uh, three months old and six months old, we have reduction of, syna of uh, synaptic vesicles in the synaptic terminals of these mice. Going into uh, different pathways, so this is, uh, this is data from, for the GABAergic uh, neurotransmission, so we, get, we got these pre and post synaptic markers for GABA transmission, and we quantify it, so every time we see here uh, pre and post synaptic puncta, they are, they are uh, colocalized, it means that we have a functional synapse. So we quantify this, this uh, puncta uh, in cultural neurons, and we didn't see any difference. And when we go to the electrophysiology, uh, so we did whole cell patch clamp, for the miniature uh, inhibitor post synaptic currents, there is no difference for the GABAergic neurotransmission. However, when we go to the excitatory neurotransmission, we start to see something different. So for example, here when we have the um, postsynaptic density 95, which is a postsynaptic uh, marker for the excitatory neurotransmission, we have reduction of puncta, and we also have reduction of colocalization. And this uh, is in agreement with what we saw since we have uh, immature spines, we have less spines, and the postsynaptic densities are in the spines. So it makes sense that uh, we have less postsynaptic density in these uh, neurons. And when we, look at, when we looked at the miniature excitatory postsynaptic currents, what we saw is that uh, there is an increase, almost fourfold increase, in the frequency uh, of, uh, in the frequency of these um, uh, excitatory postsynaptic currents, and also a slight increase in the amplitude. And looking on the electron microscopy, we also observed reduction of postsynaptic density. So uh, here we can see uh, in, in vitro, in cultural neurons, and three months old and six, six months old my, uh, mice. So we have here the spines where we have this uh, density. That's how, uh, that's how we see the postsynaptic densities in these in this, uh, neurons. And so we quantified the length and the area of these densities. So in, in both in vitro and in the brains, in the, uh, they're all hippocampus, uh, hippocampal neurons. So we have reduction of uh, postsynaptic densities. And one thing that is uh, uh, really uh, caught our attention is that we try to rescue this phenotype uh, of postsynaptic densities. So we, t we took our hippocampal culture neurons and we treat them with lentivirus encoding for the HSNAP protein. And uh, we did the same experiment by quantifying the puncta in the cells. And we, got, we were able to rescue the, uh, the quantification of the PSD95, as you can see here. So we got rescue of PSC95 with the increase of HS not activity. We also uh, uh, analyzed uh, synaptosomes from these brains. So we could isolate from, from the brains of the mice, we could uh, isolate uh, the synaptosomes, which are uh, the, the synaptic terminals in this uh, brain. So we, it allow us to enrich the synaptic proteins 
And we send these synaptosomes for uh, LCMS to see uh, different, uh, what kind of different profiles of protein we could have from that. So I di we divided here uh, in three basic uh, graphs. So for some synaptic proteins, for example, we have here reduction of uh, syntaxin binding protein one, synaptin one, as I mentioned earlier, was confirmed that was reduced also by uh, LCMS and also the calcium motor independent protein kinase, which is the protein that is uh, really, really important for long-term potentiation. And uh, we also found that uh, some uh, vesicle trafficking associated proteins also impaired in these uh, synaptosomes from the MPS3C mice, such as uh, clatrine, uh, heavy chain, dynamine, AP2 complex subunits also affected, and uh, also uh, REB7. And also many uh, mitochondrial proteins will, were also uh, reduced in the synaptosomes of MPS3C mice. Uh, another important aspect that we observed was the microtubule network. So here again we have uh, cultured neurons uh, and we see here the microtubule network when we compare the wild type with the MPS3C uh, mice that the microtubule network uh, is affected. So it, they're, they're, they're not stable as, as the, the wild types, so we don't see these parallel fibers. Uh, and here we can observe also the uh, areas of storage, this electron dense vesicles and also some electrolucent storage. So based on the, all this uh, uh, data that we, we got, with reduction of synaptic vesicles with uh, problems with the microtubule network. So we decided to, to see if the trafficking of vesicle could be affected uh, in, in the cells. And uh, so we started to, uh, we took our uh, culture neurons, we transduced them with lentivirus encoding for uh, synapsin one, which is the, the Wiesner protein with GFP. And we, uh, we took these live cells uh, with a spinning disk microscope to record uh, videos of 10 minutes. And uh, we, uh, so far we didn't see any difference in the trafficking of, of vesicles, but what we saw is that if you, we observe here, uh, there, is the, there is accumulation of synapsin one. So the, the way it is, it's expressed in the MPS3 seniors, it seems that it's accumulated uh, somehow, and uh, that, that could be something uh, linked to a uh, blockage of autophagy or the turnover of the protein. But so far, we didn't see uh, actual difference in the trafficking of uh, vesicles. So um, to sum up, so the, we have this lysosomal storage of heparin sulfate, and it leads to several uh, abnormalities inside these neurons. And we get uh, the stabilization of microtubules, we get uh, impairment of uh, synaptic uh, uh, vesicle trafficking and endocytosis. We also have reduction of synaptic vesicles and, in, and in immature synaptic spines with uh, also re reduction of postsynaptic densities. And we also have this shift between uh, axospinous to axodendritic that could be a way of compensation of the, of the signaling in the cells or there could be uh, an increase of release uh, sites of these uh, synaptic vesicles. And we also have this uh, increase in miniature excitatory postsynaptic currents that could lead to excitotoxicity. And, uh, and uh, I also forgot to mention that uh, these uh, problems with synaptic spines, it seems to be something that is, uh, a, 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 that is a trend among different types of uh, lysosomal storage diseases because we also found in Tay-Sachs and in uh, Cialidosis. So all that are combined uh, can reflect in reduced uh, plasticity and long-term potentiation that could explain the memory impairment the cognitive defects and the seizures in the San Filippo patients. So I want to uh, acknowledge my, my lab team and my PI, and uh, also Graciela de Cristo that helped a lot with this project, and thank you for your attention. Thank you for that lovely talk. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Shinji Tomatsu from uh, Delaware. Uh, 
Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, heparan sulfate level, did you measure uh, about the cell or other uh, tissues? Uh, the level of heparan sulfate? Yeah, heparan no. sulfate level. No, I'm basically just studying the synaptic transmission. So yeah. uh, okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Other questions? If not, I will ask a question. Okay. So this, this was a uh, very beautiful talk, very elegant, Thanks. and you showed very nice results from hippocampal neurons. Yes. Obviously, not all neurons in the brain are the same. Do you know anything about how generalized these effects are or whether they might be different in other parts of the brain? Now, I believe that uh, this, um, this sinus disimpairment that we found could be something that we can find in other neurons. But we chose the hippocampus because the hippocampus is the area of the brain that is important for memory, for cognition. That's what we saw that, it, that was affecting our mouse model. So that's the reason why we chose to focus on the hippocampus. But I think it could be found in different parts of the brain. Hi, uh, Jimmy Holder from uh, Houston, Texas. I had a quick question about the possible disconnect between the um, reduction in mature spines that you saw and the increase in miniature EPSCs. And kind of a correlate with that is, did you look at time course to see if this was uh, always present or if this is something that developed later in the, in the cultured spines? Yeah, for the time course, we only looked at the spines, not at the densities. So we wanted to see all these features in uh, early development. That's why we took uh, cell culture uh, um, from, for, because these uh, uh, hippocampal cells were, were coming from embryos, but we didn't really check the time course if it was something that could reach a normal baseline and then decrease. But for the spines, for sure, since, uh, I showed since 10, 10 days, uh, postnatal 10 days, it, we already have reduction of spines. So in, for us, it means that it never reaches the normal baseline. It just stays reduced. Okay, and what about the uh, disconnect between uh, reduction in excitatory spine, mature excitatory spines, and the increase in miniature EPSCs that you saw? And so that'll have to be the last question. Okay. So uh, it's just that um, because we have this reduction of uh, spines, in, in these neurons cannot really uh, make the, syn the synapses in a proper way. So uh, that's why it, we believe that this increase in, in the miniature excitatory postsynaptic currents are happening because the, the spines are not there to regulate the signaling. I don't know if this answers your question. Sorry. It's unfortunate we're out of time, so additional questions can be asked afterward. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Next, we are going to be hearing from uh, Martin Egland. And he will be speaking on, first, neuropathology and neuroimaging reveal progressive myelin-related changes in the white matter of a canine model of MPS1. Okay, thank you very much. So today I'll be presenting work um, which is done by a consortium of researchers interested in looking at myelination in MPS1. Okay, so the idea for these studies began with the clinical observation in MRI scans of patients uh, with MPS1 that there is white matter changes often accompanied by hydrocephalus, as you see here. Um, in similarity to these changes, an earlier study done by our consortium looking at an MPS1 dog model showed that there are also changes uh, of hydrocephalus in MPS animals in comparison to controls. Um, it's easier to see in the sagittal cross sections, as you can see here, where you have the corpus callosum, which is in a thick, uh, thick in a healthy animal, whereas it's much thinner in an MPS one animal. Um, when looking at the volume, you know, at the volume of this, you see that it is significantly decreased in MPS one animals. So a limitation of these volumetric studies is that they alone do not allow us to know the reasons why these changes may be occurring. So hydrocephalus greatly increases the intracranial pressure within the animals, 
and this may be causing the tissue to reorganize and the disease uh, may change in the production of the white matter itself. We know that the white matter is made of bundles of nerve fibers which are comprised of myelin sheaths as well as connective tissue such as collagen which is supporting these structures as well as cells that maintain the white matter including oligodendrocytes and other supporting glia. A limitation of volumetric, uh, sorry, uh, beyond looking at volume, more advanced imaging techniques such as diffusion tensor imaging are able to look at other parameters and use the motion and directionality of water to, uh, sorry, to uh, look at other things such as fractional anisotropy. Fresh, fractional anisotropy is the tendency for water to move randomly versus non-randomly. So in this study from 2015, we looked at FA values, and here this gives a, an idea as to what may be occurring with the volume changes. Uh, here we see in older animals that there is a decrease in the FA values in MPS animals in comparison to controls both in the anterior as well as the posterior corpus callosum of these animals. So you might be asking the question then, what does this change in FA represent with regards to the tissue itself? An obvious candidate uh, would be one of the main constituents of the white matter, which is uh, myelin. Uh, we also looked at myelin then in these same animals using myelin basic protein. And here you can see in the control animals in comparison with MPS that the, it is greatly decreased in MPS1 animals. When we correlate this with the FA values, you see there is a uh, significant correlation um, to the MVP, which is highly significant. Uh, this is particularly interesting as it suggests that FA values are indicative of changes in myelin. So to further investigate the white matter changes potentially related to myelin, we devised an experiment to look at both neuroimaging and neuro and histopathology at early stages of the disease. Um, at seven and 18 weeks of age. Neuroimaging was performed at uh, seven Tesla. Unfortunately, uh, technical challenges meant that we initially focused on the internal capsule while we are currently processing uh, values for the corpus callosum. So results from the internal capsule uh, demonstrated similarities, similarities of FA values at seven weeks of age, as you can see here with the MPS in black and the control animals in white. And you can see that both in the anterior and the posterior that the values are somewhat similar. There's actually perhaps a little bit of an e increase in FA values at this time point. However, when we come to 18 weeks, you see that there's a decrease in the FA values in both the anterior as well as the posterior internal capsule. Um, this is interesting as it suggests that changes in FA and likely also myelin are occurring between these ages. It also indicates that it is not congenital. So moving on then to the histopathology in the same dogs, it revealed several different, several different findings beginning with uh, myelination done with the classical myelin stain luxofast blue. So these sections are from the corpus callosum of 18 week old dogs, whereas the uh, seven week old animals had not yet developed enough myelin to be observable using LFB. Um, LFB was counterstained with Sirius Red, as you can see here, as well as a hematoxylin marker to look at the nuclei. As you can see here, it's obvious that with the MPS animals, there is a large decrease in the level of myelin, and this is revealing the Sirius Red below. And when you look at the quantification of it, you see that there is a large uh, decrease in the ratio in the MPS animals. And when looking at, in another way at the LFB alone, you see a significant decrease in the LFB, but you conversely see a significant increase in the serious red. So the results are similar in the internal capsule where quantification again showed a, t a clear decrease in the LFB as you can see here. And when we quantified this, again, you see similar uh, decrease in the ratio, in, uh, an increase in, a decrease in the LFB and an increase in the serious red. What's also interesting in this uh, picture you see here 
is that the, there are intermyelin spaces between the myelin which are uh, staining positive for the collagen stain. These intermyelin spaces were difficult to uh, quantify using Sirius Red uh, as a background, so we did an overstain of the Luxofast Blue. And as you can see here, the histoarchitecture in these animals is quite different in the corpus callosum, where you have a more stratified structure here, and here you have a lot more of the intermyelin spaces. When we quantified these, we saw a decrease in the uh, intermyelin spaces, which was significant. So within these intermyelin spaces are numerous cells revealed by the hematoxylin stain, if you can see these cells here. Uh, when we quantified these cells, we saw in contrast to what you might expect of a neurodegenerative disorder, that in fact in these MPS1 animals, there's more cells um, within the intermyelin spaces, as you can see quantified here, which was significant. Uh, the trend was similar in the corpus callosum, though it was uh, not entirely significant due to large degree of variation in the MPS animals, also due to the fact that we had low end numbers for the study. Um, unfortunately, we are currently in the process of identifying these cells and therefore cannot report on what exactly they might be at the moment, although a few preliminary studies have shown that they are not microglia. Uh, so whether this increase might be related to the disease mechanism in MPS1 remains to be determined in ongoing experiments. So to recap, these were the same, same animals that we had also looked at ex vivo to examine the FA and we were therefore able to correlate the histopathology of the FA values, uh, albeit only at this time point in the internal capsule. Uh, for the looks of fast blue, you see that despite the low end numbers, there's a small linear association, um, which uh, almost reaches significance. And when you look at the cell count numbers, you see there's a small negative correlation, which again also reaches significance. Uh, these, again, suggest that the FA values are indicative of changes in myelin. So, in summary, early MIRI studies show that there are differences in the white matter volume in the older dogs. The diffusion tensure imaging studies show decreases in FA which correlate with myelin protein in the older dogs. Uh, a decrease in FA myelin in the histology uh, has uh, shown that there's changes between seven and 18 weeks in the uh, myelin. Myelin changes may be related, finally, to increases in unknown populations uh, found in the white matter. Uh, so in conclusion, these studies uh, indicate that myelination may be important for the pathophysiology of MPS1 and that targeting myelination uh, may have benefits for future treatment. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the people who have contributed to this study. Thank you very much. Thank you for that talk, and, and certainly um, white matter abnormalities are a uh, significant interest at the clinical level as well. So um, very timely talk. Uh, we have some time for questions. Okay, well, I have a question. So um, from a clinical perspective, one of the things in patients who have white matter abnormalities that we um, notice first is um, difficulties with attention, difficulties with how quickly they perform tasks. And I'm wondering if there were performance tasks um, in these dog models. Um, uh I haven't specifically been working with the behavior of the dogs, but um, there have been a few uh, tests which have been developed so far. I mean, this isn't like uh, working with mice where there are very established models, but there are a few adapted uh, models, for example, the radial alarm maze, which have been used uh, to look at this. And yes, there are uh, differences. Do we have any, any further questions? I think one, the one obvious question, which is the elephant in the room, is what do you think those mystery cells might be? Well, we have an ongoing theory that they might be oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. I mean, 
which is one of the main constituents of the white matter. So unfortunately, uh, these are uh, dogs and many of the antibodies which you can use in other animals don't necessarily work within the dogs. So it's a bit of a challenge. And conveniently, you're going to be staying up here for your next talk. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Lucky me, second talk. Um, so, okay. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. I won't introduce it because you're up here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in this presentation, then, I will be uh, describing recent results uh, working with Biomarin on the effects of a novel drug called Tralicinidase Alpha in preventing neuropathological changes in an MPS uh, 3B canine model. So quickly to the, oh. It didn't, doesn't seem to be working again. Ah, there we go, thank you. Um, so quickly to disclose, uh, yeah. No, it's, it's good. Uh, quickly, I'd like to disclose that this uh, work was funded by Biomarin. So MPS-3B is known to cause progressive neurocognitive decline, and there's currently no successful treatment as there is, for example, in Hurler's disease, uh, where hemopathic stem cell transplants uh, seem to be, have some effect. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, disease is more CNS-based, and therefore, this presents a major challenge in the fact that uh, the Neglu enzyme is missing within the CNS and presents a challenge when developing enzyme therapies uh, which need to cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, the strategy which then has been developed has been to deliver a recombinant human enzyme, which I will talk about in a moment, uh, directly into the CNS. So trelicinidase is a unique compound in the fact that it is a fusion of a recombinant naglu and a modified human insulin growth factor 2. What the IGF-2 element does is that it mediates uptake via its endogenous IGF-2 receptor and in this way allows a more efficient cell uptake and delivery uh, of the naglu enzyme to the lysosome. Trelicinidase is currently in clinical trials which you will hear more about uh, uh, tomorrow. So neurodegeneration caused by the lack of NAGLU leads to several different pathological mechanisms. So to examine how MPS-3B affects the brain of the dogs, we looked at several different markers related to this pathology, beginning with astrocytosis. So astrocytosis, as you know, is an abnormal increase in the number of astrocytes due to the destruction of uh, nearby neurons from CNS trauma occurring in this disorder. And this was quantified, again, using GFAP. Microglial activation occurs when microglia, the immune cells of the CMS, uh, respond to neuronal damage. Activi activated microglia were quantified using the antibody EVA1 along with the morphology of the cells. So finally, the measurements of uh, lysosomal burden uh, look at the increase in the size of lysosomes seen within the disorder when there's an insufficient breakdown of glycosaminoglycans in the cell. To identify a lysosomal burden, we looked at the marker LAMP1. So using these markers, we were then able to perform a natural history study where we examined where in the brain these pathologies were occurring. For example, using microglial activation, we were able to see that the pathology is found in several areas of the cerebellum, including the molecular layer, the granular layer, as well as the white matter, and the deep cerebellar nuclei. As you can see, there is more pathology within the MPS-3B animals in uh, comparison to control animals. We also saw that there was microglial activation in the cortex, as you can see here in several magnifications, uh, in the diseased animals versus the healthy controls. We also noticed that there was, using the lysosomal storage marker LAMP1, uh, disease pathology within the hippocampus in several different regions, including the dentate gyrus as well as the CA1 and CA2 regions, CA3 regions. <laughs> 
So while the natural history study examined healthy animals and compared that with disease, this study was designed as a dose response experiment where diseased uh, animals were treated biweekly through intrathecal or intracerebroventricular injections with either vehicle or trilocinidase alpha for up to 20 months. The doses of trilocinidase used was either a low dose of 12 milligrams per kilogram or a higher dose of 48 milligrams per kg. When we looked at the pathology in the brain regions uh, described, beginning with the cerebellum, we see that there is astrocytosis within the cerebellar cortex, particularly within the Bergman glia. Here you can see that with the 12 and 48 milligram, there's a slight decrease, as you see on quantification here, which was significant with the 48 milligram dose. But within the Purkinje layer, there was a greatly significant decrease in the level of uh, astrocytosis, both at the 12 and 48, which were significant with both doses. So we also looked at the deep cerebellar nuclei region of the cerebellum, where many of the large neuronal nuclei, which are affected by the lysosomal storage disorders, are found. And here we saw anecdotally that there was considerably less microglia, as you can see qualitatively here. Unfortunately, we weren't able to quantify this due to a technical difficulty, but you can see that it was effective in both uh, astrocytosis and uh, microglial activation. So when looking at microglial activation in the various levels, again, it's still within the cerebellum, we saw that in the white matter, there was considerably less uh, microglial activation in animals uh, treated with trilocinidase, as you can see here. And on quantification here. However, within the granular layer as well as the molecular layer, there were uh, no differences found between the different doses. Uh, when looking at lysosomal burden in the same uh, region in the cerebellum, we saw no significant changes in the white matter. Um, but as you can see, within the granular layer, we saw significant decreases in uh, storage burden. And this was significant at the 48 milligram dose. We again looked at the deep cerebellar nuclei, and here we see uh, that there was significant reduction in lysosomal storage in this area, as well when looking in around the Purkinje cells that there was also significant reduction with both the 12 and the 48 milligram dose. However, we were again not able to quantify this region due to the same technical difficulty. <coughs> So it appears then, looking at the efficacy of trilocinidase alpha in the cerebellum, that it uh, appears to ameliorate astrocytosis both in the Bergman glia as well as in the Purkinje layer, and also uh, microglial activation within the white matter, uh, as well as storage burden within the granular layer. So moving then from the cerebellum to the cortex, we saw in the cortex that the levels of microglial activation were unchanged in treated versus untreated animals, as you can see quantified here in, in the cortex. But when we looked in the white matter, we actually saw an increase in the levels of uh, microglial activation. Uh, this increase may be due to infections from the catheters uh, which occurred uh, in some of the animals. So when looking at lysosomal storage in the cortex, we see that in both the white matter and in the cortex itself, you see a decrease of lysosomal burden, both at the 12 milligram and the 48 milligram dose, which was significant at both doses. So with regards to the efficacy in the cortex, it appears that it has an effect on storage burden, particularly within the granular layer. So in our last region, the hippocampus, the natural history study revealed that there was uh, a large degree of lysosomal burden within, within the uh, dentate gyrus CA3 and CA1, and this was largely reduced upon treatment with the, both the 28 and the 48 milligram dose, as you can see here quantified in both the dentate gyrus, the CA3 and C, CA1 regions. So in summary from the pathological studies, uh, that I presented, you see that trilocinidase alpha 
administered directly into the CNS prevented neuropathological disease onset in MPS3B dogs. In the greater context of the disease, it appears that the prevention of disease-related neuropathology in the multiple regions of the brain may be correlated with the positive effects on cognition seen in MPS3B dogs treated with trilocinidase alpha. Uh, in particular, prevention of the disease-related neuropathology in the hippocampus may be relevant for the cognitive defects seen in MPS3B patients. These results support the use of trilocinidase alpha for the treatment of MPS3B disease. Finally, again, I'd like to acknowledge everybody who's contributed to this work. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm Enrico, more Enrico from Italy. Um, I have a couple of questions. First, uh, I missed uh, when uh, when is the time point when you do all the immunohistochemistry, like after 20 months? Uh, the time point for the immunohistochemistry yeah. was after the 20 months, so, so they are quite relative. a long time. Uh, the other question is uh, whether you used a, a higher concentration of your um, of your uh, molecule to to achieve. Amelioration of the neuropathological, because as I, as I saw in the cortex, you didn't see changes in the microglia activation. So I wonder if you improve, increase the, the, the amount of the of your compound, you may achieve a better outcome. Um, well, it was decided by Biomarin to use these uh, doses, which will be discussed, I think, a little bit later in one of the other talks. So you'll hear a little bit more about the dosing. Um, but yes, I agree that uh, it would be interesting to see a number of different doses. Unfortunately, um, unlike mouse studies, dog studies uh, are a lot more expensive and of course with the ethics to, to be able to perform larger studies with many groups. Yes. Oh, back here. Over there. Questions over there. Jeff Esco, UCSD. So uh, just to clarify, so the dose that was administered was continuous? Or is that the total, that's dosing per week, or I didn't catch that. Uh, dosing bi-weekly. Bi-weekly at, at the numbers that you? Yes. And exactly. then it went on for 20 months. And then was there any comparison to the non-fusion protein, just Naglu? To the, to the what protein? To Naglu not the fusion protein. Um, yes, uh, but uh, those will be discussed in uh, talks coming up. Okay, thanks. Yes. I may have missed this, but uh, at what age did you start treating the dogs with the uh, enzyme? Uh, sorry, I, I... At what age did you start treating the dogs with the enzyme? Um, that, uh, that I'm not too sure. I think it was... Uh, 4.5 Pardon? 4.5 months. 4.5 months. So, yeah, quite late in there. Anybody else? Uh, here we go again with a clinical question. Clinical yes. applied. <laughs> That's why I'm up here. Um, so, certainly cognitive decline is a major concern in San Filippo, another major concern is the behavioral aspect. And what we have discovered in um, our natural history studies is that um, the amygdala is really implicated um, for, for some of the um, emotional behavioral concerns. And given that in humans, the amygdala borders the hippocampus, I'm not really sure of placement in dogs, frankly, but um, has there been any examination of that dog? Um, in the natural history study, I, we did not see much within the amygdala, but it is interesting nonetheless, but it could also be reflective of uh, changes which are occurring within the circuitry itself. So the hippocampus, as we see, is quite affected. So this could obviously be affecting what is going on in the amygdala as well. So. So that was examined in the natural history. 
yes. not in this. Okay, we will move on to the next uh, group of talks, and it's a pleasure to welcome Kim Helmsley from uh, Adelaide to tell us uh, of her latest work about SGSH haploinsufficiency. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Until fairly recently, carrying a mutation in a lysosomal enzyme gene has not been associated with clinical disease, with a few exceptions, of course. However, there's now growing evidence um, that heterozygotes uh, with mutations in some of the genes may have an increased risk of developing or exhibit a more rapidly progressing age-related disorder, and an example of that is Parkinson's disease. And this appears to be particularly the case for a number of genes associated with lipid transport or degradation. But there are a lot of other genes associated with lysosomal disease, and so uh, we wanted to carry out a study looking at uh, the effect of haploinsufficiency in one of those other genes, namely the subhamidase gene. This is, of course, associated with San Filippo syndrome in its um, homozygous form. The issue with uh, he uh, heterozygotes with uh, mutations in a gene uh, associated with heparin sulfate degradation um, is if you add up uh, the in entire prevalence of those genes, um, they affect around about 1 in 109,000 um, patients. Uh, therefore, when you do a, a calculation for carrier frequency, approximately 0.6% of the population might be affected. So the aim of this study was to ask whether haploinsufficiency in sulfamidase confers vulnerability to early onset age-related disease lesion formation and also clinical decline. This is the experimental design. As you can see, we only used female mice. This was a decision made for ethical reasons so that we could group house the females throughout the course of the, the uh, experiment. This wouldn't have been possible with males due to fighting. We also made a decision to implant microchips to enable body temperature measurements to be carried out throughout the course of uh, the study. And this was based on literature that we came across when we were designing the study that showed that there was a decrease in, uh, I won't point, there's too many screens. There was a decrease, if you look at the bottom graph, uh, in temperature immediately preceding death. So the end of that graph, um, day zero, is the time of death. And so there's a precipitous decline in temperature just before death. And we wanted to catch the mice before they died. We then went on to undertake a number of studies, all listed here, and I'll go through the outcomes from each of these. Um, we undertook motor function tests at three of the different time points on a minimum of 12 mice per genotype per age. And we euthanized mice at four time points, carrying out a number of different analyses. Importantly, all of these e examinations were carried out blind to genotype and with the exception of the behavior, blind to age. The body weight and body temperature data shows that there was no difference between heterozygotes or wild types across the course of the study. And we didn't see that precipitous decline in the mice that we were concerned about just before um, death was about to occur. We found that age, but not genotype, affected open field exploration. So there was a reduction in activity of the mice uh, across the course of the study, but there was no difference between the hets and the wild type animals. Neither age nor genotype affected gait parameters, so the stride length or the gait width. Neither age nor genotype affected the exploration of a plus maze, and you can see a photo of that, whoopsie does, a photo of that in um, uh, the top right-hand corner of the slide, and we saw no difference in the length that the mice travel in that maze, how many entries they made into the different arms, nor the path that they made in the open arms, and that would have been um, uh, spending less time in the open arms um, is believed to uh, demonstrate anxiety. However, what we did see was a, a mild change in, in, uh, in geotaxis. And so this, you can see some diagrams there. This is where you put a mouse on a, an inverted screen, nose down, and
those differences were in the number of mice that fell from the grid while they were trying to execute that, um, that manoeuvre. And we only saw heterozygotes fall off the grid in increasing numbers as they aged. Now this didn't appear to Uh, upside down, those mice actually held on very well and over the course of the experiment didn't um, uh, differ from the wild type animals. The striatum and the brainstem. Now the effect of um, severe sulfamidase deficiency is accumulation of heparin sulfate and we wanted to ask what happens if you have 50% sulfamidase. Uh, data. Um, the ceramide and lactosal ceramide data shows that there is no difference in the mice uh, with age or genotype. However, there was a small but significant change in phospholipid changes weren't seen in uh, mice as they aged, nor um, with heterozygosity in sulfamidase. Uh, there was a, a very small and the brainstem, um, we failed to find a difference. Thinking about um, the, the fact that we found a, a very mild motor deficiency, we wondered whether there might Twenty-one month time point. This is likely lipofuscin. We quantified the endolysosomal compartment and found that with the exception of the hippocampus, there was no change in the size of that compartment uh, as determined by LIMP2 uh, immunoreactivity. A slight but significant increase. which we know is deposited in the MPS3A mouse brain, uh, 
but we weren't able to see any of those uh, inclusions. There was, however, a very small increase in P tau immunostaining in the brain stem. that can be applied uh, to, to the brain and the stain targets neurons in a, a, a way that is not thoroughly understood at the moment, um, but pyramidal neurons in the cerebral cortex are beautifully stained with this uh, method. And you can see a photo of that here. The entire cell body and um, uh, dendritic arbor are filled uh, with this um, stained material. And so this allows you to have a really nice look at the architecture of these neurons. What we've done next is to undertake what's called shoal analysis. This is where you overlie um, concentric circles over the um, traced outline of, of that neuron, and you ask how many intersections the neuronal processes make with each of those circles. And here you're looking at the complexity of the neuron, you know, um, its structure. And usually when people look at um, the neurons in this way, they do what's called an inside-out analysis. So they'll uh, take the cell body and then they'll say that the uh, processes that come off of that are primary dendrites. The ones that come off of those are secondary dendrites and subsequent the tertiary dendrites beyond those. Uh, now that, that's obviously a really useful technique, but we also went on and used a method that was used in Bonnie Firestein's lab um, and was published a, a number of years ago. Um, but this allows you to actually label those processes in slightly different ways and to dissect um, a little bit further changes that might be occurring in, in them with either development or with disease. And what we found when we looked at 21 month old um, brain tissue, and we only did this on the eldest of our mice, um, we found that in the uh, outer portion of the cell using the inside-out approach, the tertiary dendrites made fewer crosses of those rings. So um, there were fewer of those tertiary dendrites. Coming from some of the other analyses, we also found that, um, say, between 10 and 30 microns from the cell body, um, there were fewer crosses of those concentric rings, and this, in that form of analysis, applies to the green parts of uh, the uh, arbor, as you can see there in the uh, lower part of the diagram. But this is even more refined when you take another approach and label them in a slightly different way, and what we were able to say here is that there's actually fewer of uh, the uh, uh, secondary dendrites um, that are in, in the apical part of the, the cell there um, in the heterozygous animals. So in summary, the study found that aging sulfamidase heterozygotes exhibit only a really mild phenotypic change. And whilst the expression of many of the different proteins uh, and disease markers that we looked at changed with age, they did not change with genotype. However, an evaluation of dendritic arbor of the pyramidal neurons in the motor cortex of the heterozygotes showed that there was a subtle but significant change in structure in heads. These modifications may underlie those geotactic deficits we saw, but we certainly need to, to do some other analyses um, to determine if that's truly the case. I'll just finish by saying this study did only 
uh, undertake this analysis on female mice, so our findings can't be more broadly applied. And just finally, acknowledgements, the uh, members of my team, uh, Megan, Helen, Andrew and Nazmir, who undertook all of these studies. We have a, a really nice collaboration with members of the Mass Spectrometry Facility at Samory. And I'll mention uh, Emeritus Professor John Hopwood, who was involved in the conception of this study. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Cam. I think we have time for maybe one quick question. Thank you, Kim. Wonderful talk, uh, an exhaustive uh, study, uh, very admirable. I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you think that this is part of a San Filippo phenotype, or do you think this is some independent misfolded protein response that really is not integral to San Filippo syndrome? That's a really good question, Matthew. I don't think we've done enough analysis of neurons in this way to say whether it is or isn't a part of the MPS3 phenotype. Mm. Mm. I'm going to sneak a quick question in as well. It's what you can do when you chair a session. So these are in very interesting, beautiful piece of work. Uh, do you see similar changes, but to a greater extent, in the homozygous mice? Or are these completely different phenotypes that you see in the heterozygous? Yeah, we undertook all of these analyses because, with the exception of the, the, the final set of data, the shoulder analyses, because we have seen changes in those markers in the homozygous mice. Mm. But we don't have the information on the uh, changes in the dendritic tree for San Filippo mice just yet. And it would be interesting to then see if they were different between the genders in the homozygous mice. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Right, well, I'd, I'd love to ask you a lot more questions, but uh, in the interest of time, we will uh, move on to our next talk. Uh, thank you again, Kim. So I would like to welcome Rebecca Holly from the group at the University of Manchester to talk about brain-targeted stem cell gene therapy in MPS type 2. Okay, <laughs> okay so I'm going to talk about a novel therapy that we're trying to um, establish, which is to target specifically the brain in MPS 2. So MPS2 is caused by a deficiency in hydronite 2 sulfatase, um, which leads to the accumulation of undergraded heparin sulfate and dermaton sulfate in the lysosomes of all tissues. And this leads to a multi-system disease, so we see a, a number of phenotypes in the patients, such as cardiorespiratory disease, organ enlargement, lots of skeletal abnormalities, and ultimately death in the teenage years. And what's really important is that CNS degeneration occurs in two out of three patients. And the current therapy that we have available, which is enzyme replacement therapy with hydrosulfatase, um, corrects the peripheral disease but has no effect on the brain because it cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So we believe that ex vivo hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy may be the answer for patients with MPS2. And how this therapy works is you can take autologous stem cells from your patient, you can transduce them with a lentiviral vector to overexpress IDS within these cell types. At the same time, you can give your patient chemotherapy, and then you can transplant back these genetically modified cells back into the patient. Obviously, the main hurdle is really to treat the CNS, so you need a therapy which is able to cross the blood-brain barrier and what's great with when you're using a, a hematopoietic stem cell transplant is that bone marrow-derived monocytes can really traffic into the brain so they can cross the blood-brain barrier, and that enables them to secrete enzyme which can cross-correct neighboring cells. So we've designed two different lentiviral vectors within our lab. 
The first one is based on our gold standard lentiviral vector, which we've used in MPS3A and MPS3B very <coughs> successfully in the past. It contains the CD11B. That's it. Um, myeloid specific promoter, so you're driving expression, high level expression within the progenitor cell of interest. And then secondly, we designed one that contains an additional um, APOE2 targeting sequence at the end of the IDS gene, which is, we're hoping that this should really increase the uptake of the IDS enzyme across the blood brain barrier. So we've expressed this in vitro initially, and we used a human microglial cell line, and we found that with the addition between the two vectors, we see absolutely no change in the expression of IDS, so we see very high levels of IDS expression, both intracellularly and secreted into the media from these cells. So the addition of that peptide isn't making any effect on the protein function. Um, we then did a transplant strategy to test this vector in MPS2 mouse model. So we transduced our stem cells and we put them back into mice at two months of age. Yeah. We had um, five different groups. So we had our wild type controls, our MPS2 mutants. We also had a group that had just a wild type transplant, which has previously been shown to have no effect in patients. And then we, trans, um, we com directly compared our two lentiviral um, gene therapy approaches. We had different outcome measures which we looked at. So we looked at this peripheral, um, peripheral phenotype from the skeleton using x-rays and also behavior at eight months of age. And we also looked at various different biochemical markers at sacrifice at about nine months of age. So when we looked at the cells that are going into the mice at transplant, you can see that we had a large overexpression of IDS within these um, bone marrow cells. And we saw similar vector copy numbers between the two um, transplants. When we looked at chimerism at three months, of age, we see full donor chimerism in, with the different approaches. When we look at the phenotype of the MPS2 mouse model, we see um, an increase in the size and the width of different bones, which really mimics the phenotype that we see in patients. So we see an increase. This isn't. really hard. <laughs> so we see an increase in the zygomatic um, width of the arches here. And when we looked at the treated mice in this study, we actually see full recovery of this skeletal phenotype, this wild type phenotype in all the different treatments. We use two different behavioral techniques to have a look at how these mice are responding to the treatment. So the first one, which is the rotor rod, this looks at the zero motor coordination and balance of the mice. And we use um, this system here and have a look at basically how they're running on this. And when we look at the different animals, we see a decrease in the MPS2, and this is really recovered with all three different treatments. So they're all correcting the peripheral disease. However, when we looked at a different test using the y maze, so looking at spatial working memory, we see a decrease in the spontaneous automation within the y maze in the MPST mutant. And really, the only treatment the, is, that's really working to correct this cognitive behavior is the APOE2 modified IDS vector. So we then sacrificed our animals seven months post-transplant and had a look at different biochemical markers. So the first one we looked at was the IDS enzyme activity. And you can see high levels, super physiological levels of IDS enzyme within the bone marrow and within the spleen with very similar vector copy numbers. When we looked at the brain, we actually saw exactly the same amount of brain enzyme with both approaches, which is about 3.4 or 3.7% of wild type with the APOE2. But when we looked at the plasma, we actually started to see a little bit of a difference. So we actually see an increase in the plasma APOE2 enzyme versus the IDS. 
So we wanted to have a look at the plasma IDS a little bit further, and this kind of has, um, the reason for this is will become clear a little bit later as well. So we had a look at how the VCN in those different cells reflected the enzyme activity. So when we looked at these three organs, you actually see a very positive correlation between your number of vector copy numbers against your enzyme activity. Whereas in the plasma versus the wild type, um, the white blood cell VCN, we actually see quite a different effect. So for a lower VCN, we see a much higher enzyme activity within the plasma. And when we looked at this in a different way, so we look, can also monitor IDS protein levels in the, in the plasma using an ELISA assay in addition to using the enzyme assay. And we actually see a higher activity of the APOE um, IDS version for a lower pro amount of protein. So this may imply that you've got an increase in protein stability. So another thing that we looked at, which is obviously very important, is a level of heparin sulfate within the brain. So we did this by using our HPLC technique that we have established in the lab. And in the mutant, in the MPS2, we see a large accumulation of heparin sulfate. Whereas when we looked at our treated animals, you see that there's very little effect with a wild type transplant, which is very similar to what you would see in patients. Whereas when we use our two lentiviral approaches, we start to see a reduction in the brain heparin sulfate, and it's only really normalized with our APOE2 version. And a similar effect is seen when we look at the patterning of the heparin sulfate. So in the MPS2, we see an increase in these more highly sulfated types of disaccharide, which are reduced to normal levels, back to wild type levels, with our APOE2 version. We also looked at various other things. So we looked at neuroinflammation. So we looked at various cytokines. And again, we see an increase in these um, inflammatory cytokines within the MPS2. And these were only really decreased to basal levels, to wild type levels, using our APOE2 tagged version. We also looked at the brain pathology itself. So in the cortex, you can see in the MPS2 mutant, we see a large amount of microgliosis. So if we use um, isolectin B4 at the top, you start to see these huge amount of microgliosis within the MPS2. We can also look at um, lysosomal accumulation using LAMP2, and you can see a large amount of um, lysosomal material within the mutant. And we can also use, lose, um, look at astrogliosis, so using GFAP. Whereas when we start to treat these animals, we see small reductions with a wild type transplant and also with the IDS transplant. Whereas it's only with the APOE2 version that we see full normalization of this neuropathology. So we want, kind of wanted to have a little, little bit further about why this is happening. So we know that when we look at the brain, we see very similar levels of IDS protein between using the two different lentiviral approaches. So the first thing we had to look at was whether the APOE2 version had any difference in uptake by cells. So we used this model here. So we basically just grew an endothelial cell layer on a dish and looked at uptake by those cells. And we actually see an increase in uptake of the APOE2 tagged version compared to the IDS alone. We then looked at transcytosis using a blood bound barrier model in the lab, where we looked, we added protein to the top of the well, and then looked at whether we can, um, trans we can have a look at how much protein is getting through into this media. And we actually see an increase in transcytosis with the APOE2. And then we looked at how this is really happening, and we found that rather than it just being dependent on APOE2, we can see um, that the uptake of this peptide is really mediated by both mannose-6-phosphate receptors, heparin sulfate, and the APOE2-dependent receptors. So in conclusion, we've shown that the addition of this peptide linker doesn't affect the production or the secretion of IDS. All the treatments that we can give, so looking at a wild type transplant, can correct peripheral disease. But it's really only with the APOE2 vector 
that we were able to produce this high level of secretion of active IDS in the plasma and superior correction of the brain. And we think that perhaps this APOE2 is really maybe increasing stability of the protein and also influencing and increasing uptake by multiple mechanisms. So most of this work was done by a PhD student in the lab, Helene Gleitz, and this has recently been published in Envo Molecular Medicine. Great. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for this uh, excellent presentation, a very comprehensive study. Is there questions, please? So I can't remember exactly the legend on the plasma levels of your two enzymes. Um, was that activity or was that measuring protein uh, via some sort of ELISA measurement? So the first graph is looking at enzyme activity. So we see an increase in IDS enzyme activity within the plasma. And then we looked at actual protein concentration using ELISA and we actually see an increase in activity per unit protein. So it's specific activity? It's specific activity. Okay, great, thanks, I don't want clarification. And there was another question towards the back of the room. Do you see a difference, or do you see the uh, substrate accumulation reduce in the periphery with all of the enzymes? We do. To an equal level? To equal level, yeah. Pretty much in the periphery, you get complete substrate reduction, at least in the tissues that we've looked at. So how does that, when you, you looked at uptake into the cell, into that epithelial layer, and you got, the, the uptake was different for the uh, tagged version, uh, how does that, um, jive with that uh, peripheral effect? We think that probably in, in the periphery, it seems like you need a much lower le enzyme level. So probably in the periphery, you've already, you're receiving enough enzyme from, even from an OR type transplant, in order to correct disease. It's only when you look specifically at the brain, because obviously you're not getting enough enzyme into the brain with a wild type transplant. You need that super physiological expression of the enzyme, which is driven by the lentiviral vector, which is able to be able to give you enough enzyme to aid correction. And we'll have one last question uh, before we move on. Thank you, it was very interesting. So um, APOE is a lipophilic protein, and I don't really uh, got from your presentation what part of the peptide that you're using, uh, but is some of this linked to lipoprotein circulating, can that explain some of your So stability? we're using the receptor binding portion of APOE2, so it's um, a specific region which is involved in the binding, and it's also got a, a heparin sulfate binding site within that region. And so it's avoiding binding to the LDL receptor, is that it's, why you choose the APOE2 um, peptide, is that why? Yeah, so we, we're using like two in tandem just to basically increase that binding and increase that uptake. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, let's uh, thank Rebecca again for uh, an excellent presentation. <laughs> and we, we will move on swiftly to the last talk within this session, which is from Igor Nestrasil uh, from the University of Minnesota to tell us uh, about an MRI studies in the canine model of MPS3B that we heard about earlier. Thank you, John, for the introduction, and uh, hello, everybody. So I will be talking about the same cohort as uh, Martin Egelon was talking um, a couple of talks about, a couple of talks ago. It, it's about the MPS3B dogs and the effect uh, effects of the BMN250 or or uh, trilisinidase alpha uh, in these dogs. <coughs> These are my disclosures. So, again, I will I will not be repeating my uh, re repeating what already Ma Martin has said, but uh, I will just say that the MPS3B, we see the prominent neurological disease. We see it in uh, humans, also in dogs, but the findings are a little bit different. Uh, in MRI or in neuropathology. So in humans, we uh, usually see severe cortical atrophy. Uh, 
in canine brains, it's severe cerebellar atrophy and the loss of purkinia cells. The clinical onset is at one to four years of age in, uh, in humans. In canine model, it's uh, at 18 to, through 24 months of age. And uh, usually the death appears in the second decade of life in most of cases in human MPS3B uh, and dogs are usually euthanized, uh, I think, usually because of the neurological condition at three uh, to, through five years of age. So here, uh, here is a human uh, MRI. It's the one-weighted image uh, where you can see Okay, wouldn't you hear me? So where you can see the atrophy, so this is a four-year-old uh, four uh, MPS3B subject, and here's an eight-year-old uh, MPS3B subject, and you see that there is a severe cortical atrophy, also white matter atrophy, but the cortical atrophy is the leading pattern. In uh, dogs, as I said, there is a prominent cerebellar atrophy, and over here, this is the untreated MPS3B dogs, and the, cere the cerebellum is visible here, and you see it's, uh, it's pretty atrophic. And uh, com compared to the compared to the uh, wild type, where uh, the atrophy is not apparent. So the study, study objective is the same as, as Martin uh, mentioned. So it's the assessed brain changes uh, by MR imaging, MR spectroscopy. In this study, he was talking about neuropathology. Uh, the MR imaging was done in vivo. So the dogs were housed at Iowa State University uh, at Matthew uh, Ellenwood's lab. They were brought from Ames, Iowa to uh, Minneapolis, to the University of Minnesota. They were scanned there. Um, we scanned usually four dogs a day. Uh, sometimes they brought six dogs, they stay overnight, and usually they came on Saturday. Uh, we scanned Saturday, Sunday, and Sunday they went back, so that was how it was done. Uh, Matthew, Ellenwood, he, Matthew Ellenwood, he likes to say that uh, they have, uh, we are in Midwest, so we, they have never experienced any, or we have not experienced any blizzard during these transfers, so we, we got really lucky. Anyway, so back to the study objective. So uh, basically, we looked at the dogs who were uh, affected compared to, uh, compared to, we compared them to wild type, and we compared them to dogs who were affected and treated with uh, biweekly intracerebral ventricular administration of uh, either uh, CSF, artificial CSF, or the tralazinidase uh, alpha BMN 250. <coughs> Martin already said in his talk and explained that tralazinidase alpha is a recombinant human NAGLU insulin-like growth factor two fusion protein, and uh, it's to treat the San Filippo type B. Um, so the dogs were treated with either vehicle, that's CS, artificial CSF, or 12 milligrams or 48 milligrams of tralazinidase alpha. Uh, Again, here is the, the answer for, for the question uh, that was uh, after Martin talks. So it was, uh, the drug was administered, administered every two weeks through uh, the shunt to the lateral ventricle, and uh, the start was at 4.5 months of age, and the duration was up to 12, 20 months in MPS3 dogs. <coughs> the dogs were scanned, they, they, all of them, they got six scans. Uh, every 14 weeks uh, from 6 till 24 months of age. So here's the study design again. There were four dogs in each arm, and I think I can, I can skip that because I just described that in the, in the previous slide. So we scanned the dogs on a 3T scanner. Uh, we uh, collected T1-weighted, T2-weighted, diffusion-weighted images. We collected uh, another sequences, another uh, imaging modalities, but I will be talking about uh, the results of these, these modalities that are here mentioned. We also collected the single voxel MR spectroscopy, which is a technique that measures uh, MR spectra or neurometabolites 
we measured those in volumes of interest, which were stratum and thalamus. It was one combined volume of interest, then in cerebral vermis uh, in brainstem. Uh, the analysis, the regions of interest for the analysis for the diffusion weighted imaging and for the volumetry that I will be uh, showing the results later. So we looked at the brainstem, cerebellum, and cerebellar white matter. <coughs> These were traced manually. And then uh, automatically we uh, got the volumes from, or the regions of interest were cerebral gray matter, white matter, and ventricles. So here uh, I'm showing the uh, automated automated analysis, so here you can see uh, the uh, gray, white matter and CSF. CSF is red, uh, gray matter is uh, dark green, and the bright green is the white matter. And here are the, um, oh shoot, and here are the manually traced uh, cerebellar white matter and the cerebellar volume and the brain stem. So these were done manually. This is automated. Here, the diffusion, the example of diffusion uh, weighted images. Um, here on the left and on the right, you can see the representative spectrum from this volume of interest, which was in stratum and thalamus. So to the results. So when we uh, look at the MR volumes, so we found, an in, we found that in the vehicle-treated MPS-3B-affected dogs, when we compare those to wild-type dogs and the dogs treated with the trazinidase uh, alpha, so we found a cerebral, cerebellar and cerebral CSF, the ventricles and uh, the ventricle, the fourth ventricle in, in the cerebellum, where uh, did show higher volume in, uh, in the vehicle-treated, uh, in the vehicle-treated MPS-3B dogs. And we, s we also found that the cerebral volumes were smaller in the vehicle-treated dog compared to wild type. So here it's shown in the graph. <coughs> so here's the cerebral volume. So you see the uh, dogs who were not treated are here, the black. These are the dogs. Uh, this is the wild type. And these are the dogs treated with the 12 milligrams and this, this should be supposed to be 12 milligrams and 48 milligrams, the yellow. Uh, for the comparison, you don't see much change uh, or effect on the cerebral white matter. So again, the dogs treat, uh, that are not treated, the MPS-3B dogs and treated dogs and the wild type. <coughs> So this was the volumes. When we uh, looked at the diffusion metrics, so diffusion, it's, uh, analyze, uh, it's looking at the white matter integrity, at the axons and myelin in the brain. So, uh, sorry. So we found higher fractional anisotropy and lower mean diffusivity, ax axial and radial diffusivity values in wild type versus vehicle treated dogs. The, the FA and MD, higher FA means uh, better, uh, and lower MD uh, means better white, uh, uh, white matter connectivity. And then in, in, in the treated dogs, uh, the effects were, there were like two, three trends. We, we found that in wild type, uh, we found a trend in the MPS-3B affected dogs who were treated that they reached wild type or near wild type levels of the cerebral white matter uh, FA values and cerebral white matter, MD, AD, and RD values. Uh, then we uh, also showed a slight positive uh, dose response in cerebral white matter mean, mean axial and radial diffusivities and the cerebral white matter fractional anisotropy in, in brainstem FA and no effect on diffusivities in the brainstem. So, it is shown here that, uh, again, the mean diffusivity here in the wild type, in the treated dogs, it is nicely shown that it's dose-dependent. It is pretty close in the, in the 48 milligram 
uh, treated arm, then in 12 milligram treated arm, and here, here are the dogs that uh, were treated with uh, artificial CSF. And similar findings is, is uh, for the cerebellar mean diffusivity on the right. Uh, last last uh, uh, modality that we look at was MR spectroscopy. <clears throat> and here I'm showing a result uh, of uh, spectra, or not spectra, I'm showing the result of the MR spectroscopy from the uh, thalamus and striatum from the combined voxel or the volume. And then we found that in uh, uh, dogs uh, that were not treated, not treated with, the, uh, with the drug, uh, so that there was overtime increase of myoinositol, which is the marker of glia in, in, the, in the brain. And uh, it was prevented, this finding was prevented in the dogs who were treated uh, with the BMN250 or tralazinidase alpha. Um, here are the wild, wild, type, wild, wild type levels. So we got to the conclusion. So the conclusion is that uh, with these techniques, with MR, uh, quantitative MRI and MR spectroscopy, we showed uh, sufficient sensitivity to identify the MPS3B dependent and uh, also the uh, treatment dependent effects. And also we showed that the uh, trolizinidase alpha treatment prevented or slowed down the onset, onset of many brain MRI uh, changes that we were depicting by MR imaging or MR spectroscopy. And uh, what's the good news that this treatment is now being tested in human uh, subjects uh, in, in an ongoing clinical trial. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Igor. We have time for a couple of quick questions. Do we have no questions from the audience? So I will ask the difficult question. Thank you. I'm excited. <laughs> So bearing in mind the previous talk uh, where we were looking at changes in white matter, would you care to take a leap in the dark and interpret how your data may be relating to what was seen uh, in the pathological study? So how, how was I seeing the white, so white matter changes in eyeballs and what? So it's how do your MRI findings correlate with the pathological studies we saw earlier? Oh, I, I need to think what it was. So we, uh, that M Martin, he showed in MPS3B dogs, he was looking mostly at the neurons, I believe, or, or glial changes, so he didn't show much of uh, white matter changes in this model. But what I expect, so if you have loss of neurons, either cerebellar or cerebral, and we saw it in the MRI of the human, uh, so there is, the cortical atrophy and it's being followed, I think it, 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 this in, it, it, it goes in this order, it's being followed by also the loss of axons because if you lose the neurons, you lose axons and, and you are losing the white matter. So, so there is no, it's not, it doesn't come as a surprise that you see the changes in the diffusion metrics that are looking, the diffusion is MRI modality that's looking at the white matter integrity, one of them. Uh, that we, we see these changes in, uh, in, uh, in, in those as well, uh, in combination with uh, cortical atrophy. Thank you. I think there's also that correlation between the glial marker changing uh, and the glia that Martin measured that would be interesting to follow up on. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Well, in that case, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of my co-chair, uh, bring this session to an end. Uh, I think I'd like to congratulate all of the uh, speakers in this session for setting a very high standard for uh, all subsequent sessions to follow. Uh, I'd like to thank you as an audience for uh, your active participation. Uh,
and Julie for co-chairing very expertly. I also have an announcement uh, from Patty uh, Dixon, which is after the session. Uh, please feel free to go to Harbour Island 2 to see the exhibitors' uh, exhibitions, uh, and there are snacks available there too. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you.